Nothing this is yeah. Senate Judiciary, <laughs> and I apologize profusely for Bennington, <laughs> but um, I wasn't able to uh, get people to um, uh, be here this morning that are usually here. So I'm in Bennington. You're all in Montpelier, and Eric. So Eric Fitzpatrick is going to walk us through H546. <laughs> an act relating to racial justice statistics. And as a bit of an introduction, part of this has been around before, but um, given the Justice Reinvestment II report, the final report this January from the Justice Center, indicating the uh, number of uh, persons of color who are incarcerated in Vermont, it seems more timely than ever that we have um, a, uh, a good understanding of uh, justice statistics. And part of what held the um, Justice Reinvestment too, and the working folks from the Justice Center who are used to going into states and delving into statistics was the lack of statistics in Vermont. Um, we just haven't done a good job. And, the, and so that's why this, I think this bill is fairly important. But uh, we'll let Eric walk through it. It's all of 12 pages. Um, and uh, feel free to interrupt Eric and ask questions if you have them while we're walking through. So Eric, take it away. Yes, thank you, Senator Sears. And, and uh, good morning, everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here, as uh, uh, Senator Sears mentioned, to walk the committee through H-546, which is an act relating to racial justice statistics, a pretty lengthy bill with all new language, or for the most part, new language regarding this topic. And, and as Senator Sears mentioned, uh, this is not brand new to the committee. You may recall that uh, this has been a topic that's been discussed several times over the last couple of years. It originated uh, back in 2019 when um, uh, the Racial Disparities uh, Advisory Panel, RDAP, first recommended in their annual report that uh, for the reasons that Senator Sears mentioned, the lack of data, the lack of statistics, uh, the creation of, a, of an entity in state government that would be responsible for collecting all this data and working with law enforcement agencies and the other players in the, uh, in the subject of criminal justice to serve as a repository and uh, be able to uh, make policy recommendations based on the data, that sort of thing. Um, so but then last year, so that was the 2019 report. And you may recall then last year, uh, it was discussed. There might even have been, I, I think there might have been a joint uh, meeting between the House and Senate Judiciary Committees on this last year. Um, mm -hmm. And and the uh, bill was moving along, but uh, the topic that uh, the folks, the interested parties who were struggling on was sort of governmentally, structurally, where to house this entity. I think everyone agreed that the, that the need for the, the entity was there. But I think the debate was, you know, sort of boiling it down to, you know, should it be in state as a as a part of state government, and have the advantages of having the administrative support, the logistical support, the the uh, other other entities of state government that could work more easily with the entity, uh, but maybe not be totally independent, or should it be a freestanding body that was independent of government, so that it would have the necessary uh independence to work without any sort of political influence and that was the debate that was going on last year and then it, uh as a as a way to move the ball forward you remember actually it was in the miscellaneous bill last year s97 that uh what you passed was uh, some further instructions to have rdap go back and relook at that issue and come back with a recommendation this year and so there they were tasked with all right this is the issue that's hung everybody up how are, where are we going to put this body um, go think about it some more and, and then come back with a recommendation. And that's what they did. And that's what H546 embodies, what this final recommendation was as to where to put it. And some of the other details, of course, as well, although you'll actually, you might, some of them might seem familiar, familiar. Some of the language of the details is, is uh, similar to the legislation that, uh, that you were looking at last year. 
before the issue of where to put the body kind of slowed things down a bit. So that's the background. And um, the, the bill, as I mentioned, is pretty lengthy. Senator Sears, I think probably everybody has a copy, but I could also pull up the screen if that would be easier, whatever you think would, would be the best way to do it. I've got a copy, so I don't, I, it's probably We've got a copy to just, too. Okay, why don't we just go over the bill? Okay, sounds great. So right on the first page, the very first thing that it that is being laid out there is exactly what I was just describing, which is the structure of how this entity is going to be housed and where it's going to be. So the proposal that RDAP came back with, and which is in H546, is that you know the, the existing executive director of racial equity that, that exists now within the agency of administration. So the proposal is to have the new, uh, what would be called the um, uh, the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, DRJS, Division of Racial Justice Statistics, would be housed within a new Office of Racial Equity alongside the existing executive director. So the ED of Racial Equity, which you have now, um, would, be, would have some supervisory uh, and oversight authority over this new division. And they would be, a lot, as I mentioned, alongside each other, both within the agency of administration. So they both would have the administrative support, the logistical support, um, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, and we've, there's been uh, some discussion with the administration about this, even the physical space issue, you know, so where, to, where to put the folks. And that's also something that the agency is, I think, hopefully going to help out with. Uh, but yeah, right. overall. Go ahead, yeah, Can please. I ask you a question? Yes, I don't. Please. I don't understand reading this. The relationship between the executive director and the Office of Racial Equity and the director of the Racial Justice Statistics. I don't understand the relationship. Is it that there's an Office of Racial Equity? Is right. it underneath there? So is it underneath the executive director of Racial mm -hmm. Equity? You mean it? it, it which is which one underneath? So you have, I think the overarching entity is the Office of Racial Equity. Yeah. That's, the, that's the big office. And then underneath that office, you have the director, the Susanna, the existing director, uh -huh. and, and this new division. And they would be alongside each other, both underneath and within this Office of Racial Equity. But the, the so director, the existing director uh, of so Racial Equity- So they're on the same- they're on the same level, the executive director. It isn't a division within there. And she, if she's the executive director of the office, how can there be a director of the division that's on the same level that she is? Oh, right. I'm sorry. She's not the executive director of the office. I don't believe. I th and, and, and the, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. You mean the Office of Racial Equity, right? Yeah. She's yes. the executive director of the office. So you right. have an office with an ED, and underneath that you have the division of statistics, right? The underneath the office and underneath the executive director. Yes, and that's why the executive director has this supervisory slash okay. oversight. So, You'll see in that first language there, they have this, the, the ED has this ability to, or sorry, not authority, to uh, well, appoint I, employees, apply for grant no, funding. But that's the know, director. Senator uh, Sears is uh, trying to cut in there. Okay, okay. okay. Eric, who is, the, who is the director? I think that's the question. Oh, I the first see. Yes, that, is, that the means the is it the director of the division or the director of racial equity? Racial equity. Okay, perhaps also, we should put that in there. The director of. Maybe, yeah, the executive director. Of, of racial director. equity. Yes, that's because who that means. That's who that's referring to. Maybe we okay. should put that I in think there. It be clear. No. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. And you'll see that the exist, like on the first page, the existing, the non underlined language subsection, new subsection F, director is what we just use director because that's what the existing statute is. But you're right, because of the new sort of additional layers here, it might be clearer to say the executive director so that there's no confusion. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Eric. Yeah. In the next in the next line, it says the director may appoint employees as necessary. 
I'm, I'm not sure if that's just boilerplate language. It, it sounds very expansive. Um, does that mean that the executive director can move people within the office, or does it mean that they can just appoint people and hire them? And create new job. That's a good question. I'm, I'm not really sure. And I should, that, that segues me into a, a, um, a little bit more background about my role with this bill. It, it may immediately strike you that this is, uh, you know, in many ways, government operations subject matter here. And that, and so the initial draft of this bill was actually done by Amron in our office. Um, but she got busy, as you know, with redistricting. Uh, so I've taken it over for quite a while. But some of these questions uh, I, I might re be able to redirect to her or uh, you could have, and one of your witnesses I'm sure will be the current executive director uh, so that she might be able to provide some background as well. Uh, but as far as that, that appointment authority that you were referring to, Senator Baruth, um, I'm not specifically sure whether that means, yeah, I know the current I can't remember. The, later on in the bill, you'll see that there, there are specific positions that are, well, that are created. Whether this not, also means the authority to create additional positions, I think you have to do that in statute. Yes. Um, but I, I'm wondering why that language is necessary because all, you know, commissioners and secretaries have a, a power to move within their employee system. But this language, sounds as though appoint employees as necessary. Um, it sounds as though that's a kind of novel power that I, I haven't ever seen before. So uh, that's a, a red flag for me. Um, yeah, I, and she only has a couple of people. How can she move them about? Right, but I mean, under that authority, yeah. could, could she say, I really need a, a third and fourth person I'm going to appoint them, and then the legislature is obligated to right. follow up. I, yeah, them. I think that those one and two need to be clarified. Yeah, so I will. I'm noting that right now, so I can follow up with Amherd about that and see what the original intent of that language is. Yeah, I mean, I, so, sorry. Go you ahead. only appoint what you have funding for. Right. <laughs> right. And right. the funding comes through the appropriations process. So it sounds like she can do it, but it's sort of like, how do you pay for it? Um, can I ask a question out of ignorance? Because I'm not on the appropriations committee, but this says that um, she can apply for grant funding. Does all grant funding come through appropriations or are there external sources? Through, for that? Basically goes through the joint fiscal committee. The administration applies for grants, and the grants have to be approved by joint fiscal. And then, if if there's a question, they can be held for a joint fiscal committee meeting. But I know lately there's been so many grants that we just routinely approve them. You know, the, the federal grants for, for example, the the storm that created problems in. Um, Wyndham and Bennington counties. There was a grant from Homeland Security for that, and we pretty much routinely approved those. The administration has to go through us or through they the joint out, The administration they send out a send a grant years. notice out. Yeah. One of the bones of contention is sometimes they spend the money before they send out the notice. I'm just looking at how that dovetails with the previous sentence. And, uh, well, I think that I think it's okay, but you know, maybe it's joint fiscal should look at that. Both both one and two, E one and two. Yeah, it seems to me that that they're what you're trying to say here is that she, they can apply for grant funding for this and then. Um, I would assume that with a grant, you're um, hiring a limited service employee to carry out the functions until 
until you need to go to the legislature. For Usually the those position. the grants are time sensitive, so it's like yeah. three years or two years yeah. or whatever. And you would do a limited service position. I just don't want there to be a way to bypass the legislative process. If yeah. She's given the power to appoint as necessary. She decides she wants X, Y, and Z and happens to come up with a funding source. Does that bypass the system? I, I would ask Eric if you could just run this by somebody at Joint Fiscal. Yeah. Yes. It would go before the Joint Fiscal Committee. Mm -hmm. I get notices all the time whenever um, Department of Public Safety or anybody like that applies for a grant. I get a notice that says we've applied for this grant. It's this much and it's for this purpose. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, why don't we go ahead? Um, F, F and G are just um, yeah. um, existing, right? Existing. So, yeah. Yeah. And I've noted that. So, just the, just sort of keeping in mind the concept that I've, the I've got to go help authority. Um, somebody if, if um, Senator Baruth could take over for a few minutes. Sure. Go ahead, Eric. Okay, thank you. So yes, the, the executive director does have this sort of general oversight uh, authority over the over the new division. That's the uh, the structure. You also see when we get to it. Just going to note before we get up to the language that that you'll see later on that another body that's created is called the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council. Now that's sort of patterned on structurally that what also exists right now, the executive director of racial equity also works with what's known as an, a racial equity advisory panel. So these advisory panels uh, sort of uh, work as policy recommendations. They look at the data that, that uh, is forwarded to them by the body with which they're working. In this case, it's going to be the, the Division of Racial Justice Statistics uh, you know that, that that division is you know when you'll see the positions they're IT positions primarily other people that are working in the information technology field so the advisory council you'll see is set up to have a policy recommendation role and to uh, analyze the data and uh, sift through it that the division itself creates so uh, just to sort of Eric, forecast that for you before we get to it um, I realize we're not there yet can you can you just um, clue me in on the thinking. It, it seems at first blush, it seems duplicative to have two advisory, one advisory council, one advisory panel. Um, and as I look through, it doesn't seem like the advisory council are experts. They're um, members of the community who would weigh in from different, different segments of the community. Um, but if, in my memory, the advisory panel is the same, so what was the thinking behind not just using the existing advisory panel? Or, yeah, or that's a, <laughs> yep, absolutely, yep, that certainly came up. Um, and the, uh, I think the ultimate where they landed was that because of the, um, the uh, specific task yeah. that the racial justice statistics division has. In other words, that the, that the executive director and the, and the RDAP panel and the other advisory council that works with the, with the existing exec, executive director, excuse me, have a much broader mandate. They deal with a much broader range of topics and that it was important to have a, an advisory council that was uh, very narrowly targeted to this racial data issue um, as as is the division itself, and that's where they landed as far as the reason to to have this separate body. Um, but but you're right; it's a it's a legitimate issue, and it was the same issue was discussed, and that's just where they came down. Okay. So I I think that you know our conversation about the them um, applying for grants and the appointing people. I just um, zoomed ahead to the end because I couldn't stand it. $4.2 million out appropriated to this division. 
So just so that we know, it's I'm going 4 point two. Every, every year. I, I I don't know. It just says four point two. It doesn't say that no. it has a. No, it's not ongoing because about half of it. If you if you want to skip, we can certainly look. If you want to, it's hard to sort of like reading the last chapter, right? You want to find out how it ends. I know, I know, but <laughs> like, I really needed to know if they were going to appropriate money here because she has, I think, three people in her office and she can't move them around. But there's and there's a lot of money here for per diems for people and. Um, agency of digital services which makes a lot of sense so anyway yes that's the that's the one-time money is the okay. five hundred and twenty thousand to agency of Div digital services is one time because they testified that they would need that money to get the uh data infrastructure up and going but that it would that would be done during the first year and that after that presumably they'd be all set and they wouldn't need it anymore so the ongoing money is the 363,000 for the uh, uh, staff people and uh, the office space. That's based on a uh, joint fiscal office uh, note that Stephanie did. Um, so that's where those numbers came. Actually, all the numbers are based on JFO. Uh, is it 3.3 million? Is that one time, Eric? Which one? That's for that's for per diem for the advisory council, three million dollars. No, no, it's three thousand. Three thousand two sixty. Oh, oh, I'm, yeah. Got my. Those would be some per diem. I was gonna say, my God, does got a lot of people there. Okay, I feel better now. Okay, so it's basically <laughs> three hundred and sixty-six thousand three hundred and sixty dollars yeah. every year. Base. Yeah. Right, is every year, and yeah. the 520 is one time. Okay, well, yeah. now that we've looked at page 12 Sorry. or 11, can we go back to page three? <laughs> Sorry. Or wherever you were. Okay. Yes, I think page uh, two, actually. So now we talked about uh, sort of where it's structured, and now we move on to subchapter two, which is a you know sort of, again, that's the, the statute is, sort of mirroring the structure of the bodies. Subchapter one was the executive director, subchapter two is the division. And so this division, as I mentioned, is created in, in the agency of administration, subsection eight creates it, and describes what its purpose is, and gives so it's sort of a broad mission statement and articulation of its overall purpose. So you see in subsection A, that's where it says, well, what's, the, what's this uh, uh, division doing? It's collecting and analyzing data related to systemic racial, racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice system. Now that language should seem familiar to everybody. That's the, very similar to the language, if not identical, to the, to the overall purpose of it that you were looking at last year. So that, that hasn't really changed. Um, there's some specifics added on in subsection B about what's the purpose. It's to collect and analyze this data with the intent to center racial equity, equity throughout the efforts. So to keep that as your overriding purpose, this racial equity while you're collecting this data. Um, as to pur the purpose, again, is explained further to create, promote, and advance a system and structure that provides access to appropriate data and information, ensuring that privacy interests, interests are protected and principles of transparency and accountability are clearly expressed. And then the last sentence in the purpose, which is important, is that the data are to be used to inform policy decisions. So the idea is that this data isn't just sort of collected and left alone, it's to inform policy decisions that work toward the amelioration of racial disparities across various systems of state government. So that's, as I say, a broad statement of the mission and the overall purpose of the division. Uh, that's in section 5011. So then you move on to five, section 5012. Can I ask you a question first? Yeah, please do. What does it mean to center racial equality is it should it be centralized or what does that mean with the intent to center racial equity throughout these efforts? Stolen question. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm I going to, I, I will defer to some witnesses to prov uh, provide you more detail about that, but I will say <clears throat> that that is a term that is now used center to uh, that. Uh, means to, <clears throat> pardon me, to bring it out of the margin to the yes. center. Yes, thank you. Exactly. Oh. It's sort of a, 
a newly developed a term that's sort of become more commonplace recently. Okay, I think it's a dumb term, but nevertheless, I understand it. And I don't think anybody reading this would have any idea what that means except an academic. <laughs> Ouch. 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 Ouch is right. Well, let's move right along to duty. <laughs> so from this broad mission statement, we now move to more, the more specific duties being laid out. And that's in five, section 5012. Really, <laughs> the most important one you'll see right in the beginning, particularly the first one, <clears throat> it's uh, that the division is going to work collaboratively with collaborative with and have the assistance of, that's an important phrase right there, and have the assistance of all state and local agencies and departments for purposes of collecting this data related to systemic racial bias and disparities. So you'll see what that language means is that all state and local agencies are required to assist the division and required to collaborate with the division on uh, the collection and provision of this data. I'm so, going to ask Bruce's question before he asks it. How do, what do we do if they don't? <laughs> there is not a, a penalty or a consequence mechanism in here for that. So um, it is a requirement. I think that's important. I can remember in a bill, Senator Baruth put in language or suggested in the committee adopted the language um, that there was, you know, you couldn't get state and money if you weren't keeping proper statistics and that sort of thing. So I think um, there are those who will deny and may not keep that information or not provide it. The, the other, I had a oh, comment on that. There are the um, DPS is working really hard with all the local agencies around the collection of data. And they've all gone to use the Valcor system now. So everybody is using that. And they're all collecting pretty much the same data with the same identifiers. And out of 73 agencies, 71 are already collecting the same data and giving it to the department. So it, it is happening. Can 71 I? out of 73 are already doing, are already complying. Can I ask, um, Eric, so it says collecting all data related to systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Um, is it up to the, the, the office, the executive director? Can the executive director just... Um, unilaterally lay out the fields of data that people must provide or do those have to be run through the legislative process so for instance uh, tra traffic yeah. stops we we require data but could the could the director create new categories and then this binds everyone to provide whatever that person the director asks for the answer to that is that that legislation is not required, but the executive director, or I should say, the the the, the head of the the division is called. Uh, you'll see is referred to as the division lead. So just so I don't mix up the terms, I'll try and refer to that division as the lead, and the executive director refers to the existing executive director position. So the reason I say that I say that is because. And when we'll get to this, the specifics of how that data is solicited from the state agencies. But the general uh, approach of how it works is that the executive director, the division lead, and the advisory council that I mentioned all work together to develop the list of the, of the data that these agencies are going to re be required to provide. And then that once they develop that list, um, then they solicit it from the agencies and the agencies have to provide it. Um, so that's sort of the, the general description of how it would work. Now they could do it. You'll see, we get to this too, that the, the, uh, the division is provided with rulemaking authority so that uh, the division could, and this is an interesting bit of background, uh, 
the way it's phrased now, the division may adopt rules and they would have to go through the LCAR process. So the legislature would have their oversight role in that respect if they, if they did do it through the LCAR process. Uh, but it's discretionary. In other words, they can develop these things by rule, but they, they uh, aren't required to. And there that was a point of discussion in the House for a while. The rulemaking was mandatory. And they, uh, for precisely in part for the reason that you mentioned, Senator Baruth, um, and they, they discussed and debated that point and, and uh, just landed on the side of having the rulemaking be discretionary uh, for the reason that there may be some things that the, because of the time consuming nature of the rulemaking process, uh, that there may be other uh, uh, elements of it that the division might not want to adopt through rule. So um, that's just yeah. a little bit of background to sort of explain where that came from. But it's certainly um, the, the idea uh, is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm just going to throw in this comment that we, we um, in government operations have done a lot around collecting law enforcement agencies collecting data and what they're supposed to be collecting. And there is a list of, that they're supposed to be collecting. And the they were very clear, and we might hear it here too, that you don't want that list to be defined in legislation mm -hmm. because legislation takes so long. So that if you if there's something that they say, oh my God, we we didn't get this in the bill, and we this is something we really need to be collecting. It's better not to put the specific piece of data that they're supposed to be collecting well, in the legislation. And I, I can see that, but I'm thinking about it from another angle. Um, suppose the you know the new list comes out when we pass this, and it's uh, extremely expansive, like 100 data points that need to be collected that have never been collected before. Just to pick an example, they might suddenly find themselves complaining, we can't do that mm -hmm. in the way that I'm thinking about in the Ed Committee. Um, anytime you add one piece of data that has to be reported, you get complaints all down the line because it's it's intensifying their bureaucratic uh, performance for Montpelier. And I'm just wondering if this office has the power to unilaterally generate the list, um, as well as in this draft, the power to appoint as many people as necessary. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like it is moving toward a, a very expansive view and maybe having Elcar involved or someone else isn't a bad idea before those are made mandatory on all the agencies. But I, I just flag it um, because there are a number of things about this setup that seem to me um, as though they were left uh, at a large sort of slightly um, shapeless form. And then there's gonna be a little bit of tightening. So it seems like there are two or three areas where we might tighten without doing anything to prevent what they're trying to accomplish. So. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I suggest that we move along? Um, sure. We're only on page three and we've got about 20 minutes left. So if we don't make it through the bill, we can come back to it next week, I guess. Sure. So, uh, and I've noted a couple of the points there uh, about the uh, the assistance from other state and local agencies that we've just been talking about. But moving on from there, you'll see uh, some of this list is pretty straightforward. These are the duties, the specific duties that division has. Uh, moving on, number two, collect and analyze this data that we're talking about that's related to systemic racial bias and disparities. Number three, conduct inform justice information sharing gap analyses. In other words, where, there, where are there gaps? Where are there holes in the sharing of this data back and forth between agencies? Uh, maintain and number four, maintaining an inventory of justice technology assets and a data dictionary. Data dictionaries are these sort of centralized repositories of information about data. Um, sort of maintain that structure as well. Develop a, a justice technology strategic plan you see in subdivision five, and they have to update that annually. So they got to have a strategic plan about justice technology. Number six, uh, they got to develop interagency agreements and MOUs for this data sharing and publish public use files as well. So the public can look at this. You'll see that transparency um, is an issue here. 
Uh, and they have the reporting, couple of reporting requirements. You'll see uh, in subdivision seven, first of all, they have to do a monthly report to the advisory council that I mentioned earlier. So there's gonna be this advisory council that works with them to develop policy recommendations, that sort of thing. So as the division itself collects the data and analyzes it uh, and, and uh, makes its own recommendations, it's gotta be in touch with the advisory council so it envisions this relationship so every month they have to provide this report. Then annually, you'll see that moves on to subsection B, very bottom of page three, annually they report to the legislature. So they report its data, analysis, recommendations to the legislature, this committee, the Judiciary and Government Operations Committees uh, every January. And you'll see that the advisory council that I mentioned also has an annual reporting requirement to the legislature, and we'll get to that uh, toward the end. So um, those are the, some of the specific duties. You'll, you'll see then over on um, page four, I mentioned the rulemaking, that's subsection C. See, so that the that provides the division, uh, but you'll see the, the, the terminology right now is may. At one point in time, it was shall, but so that's a, a kind of goes to the uh, part of the point that the committee has been discussing. But right now, as it passed the house, they, they landed on may. It may adopt rules in accordance with chapter 25 that's the vermont administrative procedure act so that means the rules would have to go through the lcar and the and the rulemaking process so those are specific duties with regard to so collecting the data we're now getting on to well what do they do with the data the data governance the rules of and and language about well you know what they're going to do once they have it um and you'll see at center brute this is uh, specifically, the language in response to your question is right there in subsection A. So wh what gets collected and who, who decides what gets collected? You'll see it says in consultation with RDAP and uh, the advisory council. I'm sorry, I, mis I misspoke. It was actually RDAP that's also involved in this decision about what gets collected. So it, the, in consultation with RDAP and the advisory council, the division shall establish the data to be collected to carry out its duties. So. These entities consult with each other and they decide what data, you know, necessary to uh, understand the racial disparities in the criminal justice system, which data needs to be collected, and they have to establish it. Um, I'm going to skip for a second because th there's a public records issue in subdivision one, but just because it logically just to the next two paragraphs, two and three, just, just because or at least sub subdivision two, because it's sort of flows better from what we're just talking about. So they work, so we'll go to the top of page five, subdivision two. We just talked about how, all right, the division has to work with RDAP and the advisory council to identify what data gets collected, then what? All right, subdivision two says, well, next step is division then has to identify which agencies and departments have the necessary data. That's the first sentence. So they, they do this identification, who's got the data? And then the next sentence is, all right, what if, if an agency is identified, so they're on that list that the that the division comes up with. Hey, you're the you know this Department of Public Safety, this Sheriff's Association, local police department, whatever it is, whoever's on the list, if they're identified, the agency has to provide the division with any data that the division determines is relevant to its purpose. You'll see that's in the second sentence. If if you're identified, upon request, you have to provide them with uh, data that the division determines is relevant to its purpose. The purpose being, there's a cross-reference there because that's what we went over in the very beginning, what their general purpose was. Now, there's an exception there, you'll see, for the Office of the Defender General. That's that's a specific, uh, uh, spe specifically there in statute to address the fact that the Defender General has unique attorney-client relationships uh, that could be impacted by a requirement that they divulge data that could inadvertently uh, compromise the attorney-client relationship and their requirements uh, to keep the information confidential. So there's a specific exemption provided um, to this Public Records Act issue for records that, that if, and that cross-reference exemption in Title I is for any records that if made public would cause the custodian to violate ethical standards for any profession regulated by the state. So, um, the, the DG requested that exemption and we worked on the language to make to have it cross reference the correct piece of the Public Records Act. And that's why that's there. Uh, Eric, can I ask the question? Please. On two, um, it says the division shall identify which state agencies or departments possess the data. 
but it right. doesn't say anything about which local agencies or departments might possess the data. And isn't that in conflict with page three, where it says all state and local departments have to comply. So shouldn't that read all identified state and local agencies and departments? I mean, because- Yeah, I think that's the intent. So so you're right, yes. It, that, um, it is the, the intent. So if it's uh, not being made clear, it should be, you're right, Senator White, thank you. Yeah. And it does. It also doesn't say here with that they will identify local departments um, or agencies and state local entities that might have the information required. Doesn't address them at all here. Well, it would if it added the word local. Right. Yeah. Yes, I've jotted that down right there. So that's right. That's that's what the intent. So it should be it should be local as well. Mm -hmm. And it should on page three say identified agencies instead of all state agencies and local departments. Well, I thought page three did say local. You mean subdivision it, one? It does, but it says all state and local departments. And then on page five, it says those who I, are identified. So oh, right. On page so, three, it should say all, all identified state and local entities. Oh, I see what you mean. Right. Yeah. Yep. They might even want to say identified pursuant to, you know, and then cross reference yeah. that statute. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Good point. Um, so yeah, the last, the last, back on the page five, that very last sentence too. Also, we were talking about state and local. There's also a state, a, a sentence about non-state entities. So, uh, if they uh, can enter into an MOU or um, an agreement with a non-state entity, then they can access uh, the non-state entity's data as well. So there, there's not a legal um, requirement that the non-state entity uh, participate. They they only do so if they want to find a finalize an MOU. Yes, I think that's right. There's there, there, you can't necessarily require them to do that unless you impose some kind of statutory penalty. Yeah. Well, we do have a penalty now for um, if if a state law if a local law enforcement entity does not follow state policy or. Um, if they don't, do, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, they can't have acts. They can't um, apply for grants from public safety, and they can't participate in the functions of the academy. Which means they can't send any of their officers to be trained at the academy. Which means they're um, out of luck. They, so, if they don't comply with this, if this is a state policy, they won't be able to access the. Um, academy or apply for grants. Well, that's already in law, in right. current law. Okay, where are we? So just jump back for a moment to, to page four, just that last piece I skipped for a second. So this, this now has to do with the public records effect of this data being transmitted to the division by the state and local agencies. So the general principle here is that because there was this was another issue that was discussed, you know, how how does that impact the Public Records Act? So where it landed, and I worked with Tucker, who's our public records attorney, quite a bit about this to get the language right. And the first sentence basically says, if if um, and this is the policy they landed on, if any records that are transmitted, because you think about what's going to happen, the division is going to be asking local state and local agencies for data and uh, and records. So if the data or records are exempt from the Public Records Act in the first place, in other words, if, that, if what they're asking for is exempt, then they remain exempt and shall be kept confidential to the extent required by law. So in other words, the transfer of them from the, from the local agent, the state or local agency to the division doesn't change their status. If they were, if they were confidential before, they're conf they remain confidential. So then the question becomes, all right, well, who, what if somebody requests them? How do you respond? You know, who, who, and so what the um, next sentence says, all right, the transmitting agency, 
whoever sent it, they remain the sole records custodian for purposes of dealing with um, these uh, pub uh, public records requests that may come in. Next sentence gives the division some discretion, though, uh, because you'll see that there, you're going to you think about it, there's going to be two different sets of information: the raw data that they get from your local agency, and other data that the division comes up with itself, or other conclusions, or other other uh, uh, raw. Sorry, not raw, but uh, assimilated <coughs> data that the division comes up with, which is different than the raw data. So what the next sentence says as well. Um, the division remains the agency who's going to respond to this non-identifying data that they come up with, that they, they collate. Uh, so they would be the ones who would respond to those sorts of records. So that's, that's the idea there. Okay. All right. So now we're moving back over. We're getting toward the end of page five. And so uh, I think we're getting through the, the bulk of the bottom of the stuff is going to be uh, uh, I think move a little more quickly. Um, so we're now subdivision three of page five it says the divisions well, it's got to requires them to to establish and maintain a management program for its data. And it does that in, in uh, with the support and services provided by uh, the Archives and Records Administration and the Agency of Digital Services. Both of those agencies under existing statute that's cross referenced there, they already provide that stuff to state agencies they're required to. So that's just making it explicit, but it's already in law. Um, the division also has to, so now we go on to, all right, they've got the data, they got to analyze it. That's subsection B. All right, well, they're going to do, they analyze it to so they identify the stages of the criminal and juvenile justice systems at which racial bias and disparities are most likely to occur. They recognize, sorry, organize and synthesize the data in a cohesive and logical manner. Uh, they have to present it to the advisory council Remember I mentioned they have a monthly reporting requirement, so it has to be presented to the advisory council every month. Uh, subsection C, they have to also adopt the data governance policy. You know, how is it governed once they have it? They have to have systems to standardize collection and retention, methods to permit sharing and communication between state agencies. Um, they have to recommend uh, evidence-based practices and standards. To, to state and local agencies as well. So again, the idea is that these are professional data people who are coming up with best practices that they can recommend. Um, there's also a public requirement, that's subsection E on page six, that has to maintain a public facing website and a dashboard that maximizes transparency uh, so that uh, the public and historically impacted communities can review and understand it and develop public use advisory, sorry, public use data files as well. So that's sort of a description of what they have to do. Uh, the next section, 5014, you see now it's moving on to the advisory council that I mentioned. This is the body that has this policy role, this uh, works with the division, um, specifically over on page seven, talks about, first of all, who is it going to be? It's going to be seven people. One, the, I'm on subdivision 1A now, page seven. There's seven people on this advisory council, a uh, person appointed by the governor who's got to have substantive expertise in community-based research on racial equity. So that's the gubernatorial appointment. And then you're going to have six other people who are going to be, uh, who have to have as much as possible uh, experience as one of those six, situa sorry, five situations listed there. See Roman, capital Roman numerals one through five. And the six appointments, uh, and so it's going to be facing eviction, violence, discrimination, or criminal conduct, law enforcement misconduct, et cetera. Uh, there are five characteristic qualities that the person should have experience with. And those appointments are made by uh, six listed entities, which you'll see at the bottom of page seven up onto page 12. And each of those entities appoints one person uh, uh, who will fulfill as much of those characteristics, as I just mentioned. So the entities are the NAACP, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, Migrant Justice, um, Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, and Outright Vermont. Uh, What's AALV? Oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, and you know, um, my memory is failing me on that. Uh, 
Let me see if I can pull that up really quick. I think it's a, a, a um, it's a, it's a hearing interpreter. Let me, uh, so, uh, let me follow up on that. I'm, the, what I'm pulling up is not seem to be listing the actual <coughs> names. It all says double ALV Inc. Uh, I'm not getting the full. Uh, you're, you're muted if you're trying to speak to us. This council, is it confirmed by the Senate or is this confirmed by the, by somebody? No, I think they're, the appointments are made by the governor for one and these entities for the other. And I think AALV stands for Association of Africans Living in Vermont, I believe. And um, if they don't have to be confirmed like every other board or commission. Well, I think it's like the council for the, uh, no, the existing council for the executive director of racial equity and that, and that there's no confirmation process for them, is, I think is the model that it's, that it's based on. You can walk right in there. I have to well, say, I'm still, I, I, oh, go ahead. Dave. Well, I, I think I need to get more testimony on this section because I don't quite, um, we're giving a government, we're allowing different private entities that may or may not be um, nonprofits or whatever their charters are, the right to appoint people to a state council and then there's no oversight of who's who's selected and they're four-year terms yeah which is a pretty hefty amount of time to yeah. commit uh i'm i have to say i i remain a little um confused about why we're, we're duplicating the advisory panel because in, in the case of the existing advisory council, I think it is, they're advising the, the director of racial equity on general racial equity and social justice issues. This is an office that's dealing in hardcore data. And I don't, I don't see how it helps to have people without experience in data advising the experts, because what's gonna happen is the experts will provide the data and the analysis. And then it seems to me the advisory panel won't have a great deal to do, especially since we're filling out that office with a good number of employees. So I, I think if there's gonna be an advisory role, I don't see why RDAP wouldn't mm -hmm. take on that advisory role in the same way that the director of racial equity, the executive director, is expanding her portfolio to include this. Why isn't RDAP taking that on? Uh, especially since the list of liaisons to this committee, it says that each uh, entity shall make available a person to serve as a liaison. So we're creating the office, the advisory panel, and then about 10 liaisons to work with the advisory panel, to work with the office. It just seems like a kind of duplication along the way. And I don't think you would lose anything by, um, I, I mean, obviously if you wrote this piece of language, you're, you're attached to it, but it does seem duplicative to me. I agree. I mean, we don't usually set up um, councils and the appointment, who appoints them, doesn't bother me as much as that it looks like it's just adding another layer yeah. here and 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 they are people with um, expertise in collecting right or interpreting data data. or interpreting data so anyway I think we should look at that a little more I agree is this something that you would talk to your committee about tonight it seems really like government operations 
it, it is. I don't know why it didn't come to us in the first place. We usually deal with boards and commissions and councils. I don't know. It's between I don't you know. And yeah. I mean, we can we could look at it without you know, like without it. taking it. We could just look at it. If you want to take it, go well, right ahead. We're happy to look at it without <laughs> taking it. <laughs> I, I think. Um, government ops it, looked at it in the house as well, just so you know. It went to House Judiciary first and then government ops second. Yeah, and it needs to go to appropriations too, and it has to be all yeah. the three weeks. That's right. And I, I, I am going to, before we look at it at all, I would make a, I, I like to see a chart, you know, how how they fit together and where they are and where they come from and stuff, so like an organizational chart. So I'm going to try and do that with this. Plus, I'm a little nervous about setting up a data collection entity that is made up of advocacy groups. Yeah. I mean, I, I noted on here when I looked at the makeup of it, I said, but there's nobody on here who right. actually collects data and knows what data is mm -hmm. collected and how they collect it, and whether it's easy to collect or not. And um, I saw that our was I, involved. I, I, as yes. we take testimony next week on the bill, um, I think we should be focused on what are the duties of of the liaisons, what are the duties of the council, and how is that all going to work? To I mean, I think we all agree that the need for um, data collection and the need yeah. for an analysis of that data and a better understanding of what we can do to um, as best eliminate systematic racism within the criminal and juvenile justice system. That's the goal. I don't know if that gets if this bill gets us there. So I have a lot of questions, um, but we're going to move to next week um, on that um, when we take it up again. But I'm going to. Um, I assume Stephanie Barrett's aware that there's money in this bill. Yes, that, as I say, that was the JFO that came up with the numbers. I'll, I'll alert yeah. Stephanie and Jane at this, this it, section of the bill. It, it was on the uh, sheet that Mary Hooper gave us. Oh, okay. it was li listed at the bottom as um, they already, I think, accounted for the funding on their end. Okay. Can well, I just add one last thing, Senator Sears? Uh, sure. Just to, just to tie up this last point that that everyone's been talking about, which is the the how the advisory council fits in. A similar discussion was had in House GovOps, and uh, you may have noticed this, but the very last line of that section about the advisory council is that it sunsets in five years. And that's how, that's sort of how they, they landed is uh, one of the um, ways in which they uh, sort of threaded that needle was to say, all right, let's see how it goes for a period of time and we'll put a sunset on the council. Not on not on the division collecting data, but on the oversight council. So I think it's I think it's five years. Uh, yeah, twenty twenty seven. I think other than that, you covered all the rest. You already you covered the approach. Oh, well, I'm on page eight, right at the bottom. The following entities shall each make available a person to serve as liaison with the council for purposes of providing consultation as needed. Number one is the Supreme Court. I don't know that we can do that with a separation of powers issue. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's similar in terms of the, even though know, sometimes when you set up study committees, you also require a court person to be on. In a sense, you're, you're, you're uh, you know, depending on them to participate, <laughs> they, they they could refuse and make a separation of powers argument, but uh, you could even change that to a may if you wanted. Uh, but uh, I think that's sort of an ongoing point that that uh, you've identified accurately. Thank you. Oh, also a little bit of background on that, just so you know, that list of liaisons was originally part of this council. So the council had like 17 oh. members and, mm -hmm. and those, those 10 plus the seven. So that became perceived as too unwieldy. 
So rather than having so many people on the council, they put this group, uh, assuming that they would sort of be involved in this whole data project anyway, as as uh, liaisons rather than uh, official members of the council. Well, there's one thing to gather the data, and then it's how you interpret interpret the data, and that's uh, I'm not understanding the connection here. I need I need further information, and I'm glad the government operations committee will look at this too, and particularly the makeup of the various groups. Um, so, with that said, we're going to take a five minute break, and then come back and do the racial covenants.